Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, Dan and myself will get started in just a few minutes. We're going to give everyone the opportunity uh, to, to log in and we'll get started. Thank you again for being here today. Great topic, Raphael. Looking forward to joining <laughs> everyone joining us here. Yep. Good list of attendees so far. Certainly a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention. Definitely not. <laughs> sure. Definitely not. Yeah. In fact, I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen another topic with the word fiduciary in the, uh, the, the title of it. So uh, I'd hate to say we're a trend setting here or uh, breaking <laughs> boundaries, but it seemed, kind of seems like that, which is ironic though, right? Uh, there's a lot of discussion online. You just you Google it, but uh, I haven't seen too many uh, people put enough emphasis on it. So it's right, a great right. one. Yeah, that's probably why we got uh, about 150 people that registered. So awesome. Very good. I think a particular interest is our angle here. Um, as once we get into the uh, discussion part of the presentation, hopefully everyone has a lot of good questions for us. Uh, definitely, as you're filing in, hit that Q and A button and uh, send uh, send the questions over. Um, Rafael and I will get to those at the end of the session for sure. Matt, I forgot to mention, if you can make sure to press record. Oh, it's already recording, excellent. For all those attendees just coming in, uh, Dan Odessa and myself will be getting started in a minute or so. Uh, we're giving everyone the opportunity to go ahead and log in. Um, as mentioned earlier, if you have any questions or you have uh, any any items uh, with regards to uh, your fiduciary responsibilities or anything with regards to liability, uh, feel free to put the questions in the Q&A below. Dan and myself will do our best to try and get to all the questions um, somewhere either through the presentation or at the end of the presentation. Again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we're looking forward to getting this topic going and uh, providing you as much information as we can today. All right, Dan, I think we have a steady number now. If you wanna go ahead and, uh, and kick it off. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, if you're uh, just, if you're just getting into the room here and as more people file in, obviously we'll continue to reintroduce ourselves until we're, uh, we're comfortable that we, get, we got the number that we're, uh, we're gonna be stuck with through the end of this. Uh, we hope you join us through the end of this. Uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, you have questions, make sure that you submit them, hit the Q&A button. Raphael and I uh, want this to be a, uh, an educational process and part of that process is making sure that we're answering your questions. Um, obviously talking at you, um, we get our message uh, delivered, but we want to make sure that it resonates with you and that we have answered any sort of questions. But if we don't get your questions today and you think about something after this, we will be putting up our contact information at the end of the presentation. Be sure to shoot us an email, give us a call. Um, either one of us would be happy to take you through each of the issues um, concerning such a big, robust topic. Um, obviously, in one hour, there's no way that we can cover all of the issues uh, that may uh, that may impact you as a board member. So we want to make sure that when you are making decisions for your community association, that you're doing it um, and, and fully understand the, your obligations and certainly the limitations of the decision. So as the title says, mitigating liability and protect your fiduciary responsibilities. Um, big, big topic. I'm Dan Odess. I'm president of Global Pro, where we manage your risk to recovery. We have managed more than a billion dollars in recovery. We represent more than a thousand community associations uh, throughout the United States and abroad. Um, <clears throat> I have a uh, bachelor's degree in engineering, uh, went on to study a master's in engineering as well, um, licensed as a general contractor, as an insurance agent, as well as a, a public adjuster. I've testified in court as to causation um, and damages and, and 
many, 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 many different cases. Um, certainly uh, spend my time uh, publish, publishing my opinions uh, and assisting community association board members as well as property managers in dealing with complex insurance issues. And things are only getting more complex. And the man that probably knows how complex is are getting four uh, board members and as well as managers as alike um, is, is the gentleman I'm joined with and very happy to uh, share the stage with Rafael Aquino um, of Fitting New Management. Um, you know, again, thanks for joining Global Pro and Dan Odess um, and, and, you know, for this awesome, awesome presentation. Rafael, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself as well to, uh, to all of our attendees. Sure. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure always to be alongside you on these webinars. Uh, I, myself, my name is Rafael Aquino. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Affinity Management Services. Uh, we are a community association management company that services the Tri-County area, Dade, Broward, and West Palm Beach. Uh, we service approximately about 9,000 units throughout the Tri-County area, close to about 57 associations. Um, we're a growing organization, uh, not a small mom and pop, and not a little, uh, large, big corporate uh, organization. So if you're looking for that uh, personalized touch, uh, you're, you're dealing with us now. As Dan mentioned earlier, we're also very much involved into providing education and assisting board members in, in trying to get you a better understanding of how the, the, the industry works, uh, the intricacies, intricacies of the industry as well, and also some of the challenges and how we're able to maneuver through, uh, through these challenges. Uh, none of this is possible unless we partner up with strong partners such as Global Pro. Um, so I'm appreciative to you, Dan, for allowing me to be here today and for your team uh, that assisted in putting this together. So let, let's get started on, on today's topic. So, um, you know, we get asked many times, you know, what is fiduciary? So um, at least from the manager's perspective, uh, we're, we're actually, there's actually law that, that states uh, what our fiduciary responsibility uh, um, is. Uh, to the board of directors and to the board of directors is really what we do is we act as your agent. Uh, we have a responsibility to your association to act in, in an honest way and also in a good faith uh, for your board of directors as well as the residents of, of your association. Uh, for board members, uh, you have a bit more. Um, as you, could, as you can uh, uh, understand and appreciate, there are many responsibilities that you have that are dictated within your documents and, and a lot of these responsibilities you can't just set aside. Um, in today's conversation, we'll go into a little bit more with regards to insurance, with regards to the management aspect as well, and, and your responsibilities as board members. But it's important to keep top of mind that you have a big responsibility to your board members and to your association and to your residents, I should say. And, um, and it's important that, that you understand what these responsibilities are. Absolutely. And taking that one step further, uh, there is a Florida statute, which is on point, uh, 718, 711, many of you are probably familiar with that number. Um, that's chapter 718. And uh, I encourage all of you, if you are a actual sitting board member or a property manager and you have not read through chapter 718, uh, while it may put you to sleep several times while you're trying to get through <laughs> it, um, as Raphael's laughing, because it is, it's very dense, it's very complicated. There's, there's a whole lot of information in there. But it's really, really important that if it is, if you in fact have a fiduciary obligation, which you do uh, to your association as a board member, meaning you have a liability in your, the way in which you make decisions and there may be consequences to it, whether they're allegations of it or if it's proven, um, you wanna be sure that you adhere to these guidelines that are set forth in our Florida statute. And full disclosure, I'm not an attorney, so this is not legal advice. And just like Raphael will do, he'll encourage you Obviously, get the advice of counsel when dealing with complex issues. Again, this is this is really just a warm up, right, guys? This is not to get into really a lot of the minutia and the detail of it. We are going to get into some specifics related to insurance and recovery because that's our expertise at Global Pro. And I want to bring it back to to some situations that is very relevant to you as board members that you're dealing with in an area where I see a lot of people, I believe, violating their fiduciary responsibilities and obligations. And Raphael will talk about the three pillars of that. But before we get to that, just a second, this is the Florida statute. And the, and the last sentence of this really brings it together. The officers and directors of the association have a fiduciary relationship to the unit owners. The Florida statute says it. So just remember that, that when you're making these decisions, how you're making them and how you get to your final decision on what you're going to do on behalf of your unit owners 
is bound by Florida law. And it's very important that you fully understand your obligation. So again, check out the Florida statute, get through it. But it's not the only Florida statute. And I want to say this real quick before we move on to the, the really like the three pillars of being a fiduciary. Uh, and, and that is that there's other Florida statutes that are important here. There's 626, chapter 626, as well as chapter 617. Um, it talks about the standards of care of a business. It's very important that you understand those things as a nonprofit and how you're making decisions, how it may implicate you as a board member in, again, an allegation, a simple allegation, or you may be proven to have violated certain fiduciary obligations. So again, chapter 718, you definitely in chapter 711, you got 626, which is on property insurance, as well as 617. Again, these are really important Florida statute chapters that we all encourage you all to read as board members, get into them. Don't just take the advice of your counsel, go read it for yourself, then ask the questions of your counsel or professionals like Raphael or myself as to real life application of these things, where we've seen people really stumble and fall. We wanna help you avoid this risk. And we all are, we, at Global Pro, we're all about risk mitigation. That's really what this is about. So board members really take this to heart, take this serious. This is something I don't think gets enough attention. So in, 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 in our discussion portion of the presentation, when Raphael and I are getting a little bit bigger here, we're gonna specifically talk about some examples um, where I believe that people have fallen down. So Raphael, I've, I've mentioned it a few times. Let's talk about those pillars. Sure. So the, the three pillars that association uh, board members should always keep in mind um, is the duty of loyalty, uh, the duty of care, and the duty to act with the scope of authority. So this pretty much gives you a high level of what your, your, your pillows are um, within your association. And it's important that you have these in front of mind. Um, you know, many times uh, I can give you thousands of examples, unfortunately, um, where the duty of care, the duty to act always gets just set to the side. And it gets set to the side many times just because of either a, uh, what they perceive to be a financial circumstance or a financial issue that they're having. And the reality is that you have a responsibility to your residents to set that aside. You need to correct these actions. You need to take whatever uh, steps the, the, is required in order to make things whole or depending on what the circumstance is. Um, there's been several situations, unfortunately, that we've been part of where these acts get set aside and, and there's lawsuits and, and there's other issues that arise that become much more expensive for the association, much more challenging to deal for the management company, and just makes things much harder than what they really should be. Um, Angela here asks a question with regards as if this webinar is just for condo associations. Uh, no, not necessarily, because if you're in an HOA, you still have fiduciary responsibilities that are, again, still fall within these three pillars and, and are outlined within your association documents. Yeah, this is, I like to use the, com, the community association word as a whole, as, as it, it captures both homeowner associations, condom, uh, condominium associations, as well as co-ops. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of these same obligations um, for co-ops. So uh, just understand that. And I, and I think one of the things we want to hit on real quick is um, an issue regarding bylaws and how you tie all of the laws into your bylaws and making sure that there's consistent and updated um, I mean, Rafael, I mean, as the role of a property manager and we're dealing with fiduciaries, um, you know, how important are those bylaws um, in dealing with these issues of being a fiduciary? So they're very important. I mean, so important that, you know, the law changed, I believe it's two to three years ago when it, when it uh, made board members responsible to not just uh, uh, take a course. That's what we recommend to take a course that gets you uh, board certified. So that way it states that you've read your documents, you understand what's going on in these courses. You're able to uh, know what the legal changes are because every year we're going through uh, legislation um, or sign a simple affidavit, which is what we don't recommend. So if the state is telling you that you need to sign, that you need to read these documents and it's telling you something that, you know, yeah. <laughs> what's in there is important. <laughs> You know, many times, unfortunately, what we do, because we're human, you know, no fault for anyone. When you see a, a, a document that's about 150 pages, if you're lucky and small, um, you know, you kind of set it aside. Oh, it's not a big deal. But later you find out that that's really the Bible for your community and the guide that helps you understand what your responsibility as a board member is, as well as a resident. Uh, and if you don't you, if you don't understand that, then I'm not sure why you're even sitting in that position. 
another another long, dense, boring set of documents written by attorneys. So uh, again, we're giving these guys, we're giving you board members as well as managers a lot of homework here. But um, if you haven't seen your bylaws or you don't have a copy of them, go ahead and request them and look at the date in which they were last ratified. Um, I think it's really, or where any addendums are added to whatever else. Um, I can't tell you how many times we go to newly updated buildings that you would walk into and they're beautiful lobbies, new windows, roofs, and everything else. And we have a, a major loss in the building, multiple floors, units, all damaged by, because your older buildings, they have the common area um, walkways or hallways and they're all adjoining. Unlike some of your more newer modern buildings where the elevators kind of go right up into the units um, and you don't have as much common area. But for the older buildings that update themselves, and then I go ask them for their bylaws, and I find out the last time that anyone had any like updated and everything else was 1986 or some other, you know, in the 80s or the 70s, and we're looking for provisions regarding insurance and issues and trying to determine what areas are limited in common element based on the actual bylaws themselves. Um, a lot of it resorts back to the Florida statutes, and these older bylaws are not consistent with the newer statutes on issues of common areas, limited common area elements. So it's, you know, just again, it's great to make sure that those things are updated, uh, particularly like for balconies and who's responsible for care and maintenance of certain things. Um, these are the areas where we see failures occur, uh, where people make claims. And then when they go to look at their bylaws, there's really no clear de de definition as to, you know, who's actually responsible for the insurable interest in certain particular issues that may be deemed or claimed to be maintenance issues or sudden or accidental casualties that are recoverable. So again, really great advice. Make sure you look at those things. Make sure that you're updating those things um, and, and do your homework. Uh, you get elected to the board. Um, you know, a lot of, it means that your unit owners are trusting in you to make decisions in their best interest yep. based on these governing documents. So I, I think that's, that's a really important thing. Um, let's talk about expectations. Expectations is a big loaded word. Uh, we talk about it all the time. Um, what what are some of the expectations as a board you should have for managers? I think it's a great one. I think it's a great question as it relates to mitigating and fiduciary obligations. As a board member, what should our expectations be of our manager? Sure. So, you know, it is a pretty loaded question because a, a lot of it, uh, I hate to give an attorney response, right? A lot of it depends, yeah. but <laughs> let's go high level first, right? So you, you should definitely expect from your camp to be professional. Uh, be an individual that that's trustworthy, uh, be an individual that's honest. Um, our industry in itself, the, you know, for community association managers um, has grown and it continues to grow. And it's becoming, it, it really is a beautiful profession. It has many challenges, uh, but you're able to help a lot of residents and board members. You know, the only, the only uh, difficult chat, the only difficult part about it is that you don't get too many pats in the back. But if you're, you're okay with that, <laughs> you, get, you can get a lot of things done. And it'll be a very rewarding profession. Um, but ultimately, again, it depends on, on the role that the manager's playing um, at the particular community. Our, our industry is structured in different ways. So if you have a night manager uh, with a team in place with 30 plus individuals at the property, you can expect a bit more from that individual than, you know, if someone's managing multiple properties. Um, but overall, the, the expectations really fall into very similar to what the three pillars are for, for the fiduciary responsibility of a board member, you know, is, is making sure that you're acting. Um, and and as, a, as a manager, you can't act too far. You know, you have to prepare uh, the information that's necessary. Uh, the way that I kind of like to, to look at it is giving like kind of a sports analogy is if you're either basketball or football, you know, you have an owner. The way I see it is the owner is the board of directors. If you have a management company, that's kind of your coach. And then if you're a manager for the community, you're either the quarterback or the point guard. And you're the one kind of really uh, looking for the right professional who you're going to, you know, pass the ball to or dish the, the basketball to, to help you. Because as managers, you know, we're expected to know everything. But the reality is, is, is our expertise is really finding strong professionals that, that are strong in that area um, or that sector that we're dealing with the challenge and handing the ball over to them and then making sure that we're managing that process. You know, unfortunately, too many times, it, it, you know, we're, Boards are, are, are trying to be responsible with the money, but not really being too smart with it. You know, we're putting these responsibilities onto managers that, that don't belong, that, that it's really not the manager's role at all to be dealing, let's say, with claims. That's something that, that, that I'm sure you've seen, and, and I would love for you to elaborate on it. Um, 
So, so it, it's very important to keep that in mind that really what the manager does is facilitate the process. And yes, we do have some skill sets. I don't want to say we don't have any skill sets in any way, um, but you know, we problem solve, put things together and basically chew it up for, for the board of directors to be able to make a, an easier uh, decision. You know, Dan, I, I, if you don't mind, I would love for you to kind of chime in a little bit of, of some of the challenges that you've seen, at least in your sector, where maybe the board has pushed management a, a, a bit much into taking cer certain responsibilities and what those impacts are to, let's say, like a claim or, or, or dealing with any insurance challenges. Well, yeah, you mentioned you just mentioned about hiring professionals. You hired your property manager to manage your property. Uh, many of the things you see them do, uh, or, or many times you don't even see them doing the things that they're doing on a daily basis, dealing with yeah. all kinds of different requests, whether it's certificates of insurance to um, access to the properties to, uh, you know, uh, John and Joe are, are doing construction and, and coordinating when that's going to happen and then policing when they're starting and stopping. There's so many different things that on a daily basis, and certainly there's that expectation that you do those things, just like you will hire a, an accountant to file your taxes or to do budget planning, right? You rely on a CPA to assist you with doing budget planning. You hire a lawyer to make sure that you're complying with your legal obligations or to defend a lawsuit or in investigate potential lawsuit against the unit owner or a vendor that may have done something that they should not have done, which is a violation of the bylaws or the governing or whatever governing laws that you might have for your actual, your property. Similarly, when you're dealing with an insurance claim, many people think that, well, I have a broker or I have a property manager. Right. And then they take that onus and obligation and they put it on the shoulders of the property manager to deal with the broker. The reality is that your broker, 220 licensed individual like myself, um, is there to sell insurance, sell a product. They're not there to actually adjust a claim. In fact, if you read the Florida statute on brokers or agents, it says nothing about adjusting claims, just like if you read a statute on property managers or as fiduciaries and what they're and the decisions that they're making, they're not there to adjust claims either. In fact, if a board or a manager were to adjust a claim, they are shouldering, shouldering all of those fiduciary obligations. They're yeah. making decisions for the association that they quite frankly are not qualified to do, just like you're not filing your own taxes or doing your own legal work or performing your own construction uh, or designing the actual work that needs to be done. That would be an architect. You're hiring licensed professionals to, to come in and take on those obligations. But when it comes to insurance claims, there's a very odd kind of weird situation where we think our broker who sold us insurance should be helping us. Oh, that's what we pay them a commission for. No. You pay them a commission to sell you a product. You pay your manager a fee to manage the property. You don't pay either of them to adjust a claim. And even if they tell you that they have risk managers on staff or claims professionals, they're not coming out to the property to adjust a claim. They're not going to assess actual coverage. In fact, that's the obligation of your insurance company, not you, all right? So your only obligation is to prove your damages, but proving damages isn't just producing contract or invoicing or estimates. No, the actual adjustment of a claim, making sure that you have someone representing your interest, the only person that can possibly do it is either a licensed public adjuster or an attorney acting as a licensed adjuster. A licensed attorney or a licensed public adjuster can adjust a claim on behalf of policy. The only two people that possibly can. In fact, there's a huge mega campaign against contractors, the unlicensed public unlicensed practice of public insurance adjusting right now going on. They passed more laws last year. They're going to pass more laws this year about it. They're make, they want to make it clear to contractors that try to get involved in the claims process that they themselves cannot adjust the claim. They're making it very, very clear. But we rely on our contractors a lot of times where our property managers or our brokers can't get it done. You just think simply, oh, I'll let my contractor do it. They're just going to get reimbursed. Again, not licensed to do it. But a licensed public adjuster or a duly licensed attorney that is acting as a public adjuster truly are the only individuals that are obligated or, or are, uh, can possibly represent your interest in adjusting a claim. Just like the attorney doing the legal work or the accountant doing the financial work or the property manager doing the managing, that's what those professionals are there to do, like us, 
Global Pro. We are a group of licensed public adjusters as well as licensed attorneys that represent the interest of community associations, HOAs, COAs, co-ops in claims and making sure that they get recovery because there's so many different nuances to it. All the Florida statutes that I re referenced earlier all include certain particular information as it relates to how you should be recovering. And unfortunately, you can't just simply rely on your broker to do these things because again, they're not licensed to do it. You can't rely on your manager to do it. They need to go back to managing the property. And I, and I feel like when you try to shift that burden over to your manager or your, or, or your broker, you think that maybe that's a way in which you can save money. But if they don't know what they're doing and they're not licensed to do it, all you're doing is shifting or trying to shift fiduciary obligations, responsibilities of you as a board member to other individuals. And it's number one, not fair, not correct, not proper, nor are you ever going to get everything you're entitled to in your recovery and making sure that you're also protecting your rights and responsibilities if in fact your insurance company doesn't properly pay you, which is a lot of downstream implications of doing that stuff. So you got to make sure that you fully understand who's who the role players are and who is obligated to do these things and the limitations of their licensing. Again, even if your broker says, I have risk managers, I have claims professionals, it doesn't mean that they're there to represent your interest because as a 220, they cannot, they're not there to adjust a claim. Being very, very clear about it. Just like your manager cannot adjust a claim. They could certainly facilitate and give information and documents, but they have no, but they are not going to understand, break down, define obligations as pursuant to that contract of insurance and interpret it based on the Florida statutes and walk you through the claims process and determine causation and liability and whose burden is what, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not there to do those things. They're simply there as facilitators to make sure that people have access, that people have records and information, but they're not there to adjust claims. And you don't want to burden them with the obligations to do something that they're not licensed to do, just like your contractor shouldn't willfully burden themselves with that obligation to do it. And, and in fact, there is a recent case where, where they talk about this willful disregard for property. And truthfully, if your contractor is saying, no, 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 give me that assignment, give me that obligation, they're willfully, willfully disregarding you and your obligations or as fiduciaries because your bylaws, I mean, Raphael, right? And your bylaws, what is to go through a typical, I guess, let's walk through a typical construction process. Yeah. If I were to, let's say, doing an improvement in my lobby, and I, and I know there was a question about it, what is a typical practice that we see? What, what would it, what, what would a community, let me put it this way, what would a community association typically need to do to improve their lobby, step by step? Sure. So to improve your lobby, you know, it depends how you're going to change your lobby, right? So if you're just kind of looking to to keep things um, the same, in essence, just kind of uh, revamping it, then, you know, it's just going through a process where you're getting your proposals together. Well, first of all, you got to understand as a board what you're doing to the lobby, because the lobby, again, could be a loaded question because you have many lobbies now being upgraded to keep up with what's going on with the buildings in downtown and Sunny Isles and all the areas, all the competing buildings that you're competing with you want to make sure that your building is marketable. Um, so if you're going through a very detailed process, number one, as a board, you're first going to want to look at the finances and understand what kind of budget can we set aside um, for this particular project. Once you have somewhat of an understanding of how you're going to come together with that kind of money, then you're going to want to go out and get an, uh, either an architect or an engineer, depending how thorough you're going to go with this upgrade, and have them outline what the specifics are of this, of this, of, of this change. Uh, once you have that, then that kind of gives you what we call like a scope or an RFP, what's also known within our industry of what are the changes that are going to occur. Uh, with that scope, then that assists the manager to be able to send that out to three contractors and get an idea of what the costs are going to be associated with those items um, and, and so forth. Um, from there, then there's a thorough process that you should be going at, um, which is interviewing the companies, making sure they have the proper licenses and insurance. You should actually do that before you even give them the RFP. Um, but then you're going through that thorough process of investigating the vendors, uh, making sure that they're properly qualified to do the necessary job. Once you have your kind of your ballpark figure, then you will go back to your numbers and get, a, get an understanding of you have the ability to be able to pay for this project. 
a strong recommendation, especially for board members where many times they, they fall short is they don't have any kind of contingency funds. They believe, okay, it's a million dollar project and it's, we need a $1.1 million loan. Um, we take an opposite approach. We'd rather be proactive. We don't need to disclose that to the contractor. But the reality is, is that, you know, once you start either if you're going in, in depth and changing walls and moving things around, then basically, you know, you're going to see things that you weren't expecting to see that the engineer or architect would have never saw. Uh, so make sure that you have the proper contingencies in place. Um, if you're dealing with an engineer, they can give you a ballpark figure. And, and that way uh, you're properly funded should any major changes occur throughout the project. As a point of reference, especially that I mentioned moving walls and so forth is if you're doing that kind of change, you're going to want to make sure that you consult with your attorney. Uh, because if you're making any major changes to, to your association or to the property, then it, is, it, it can require a vote, or even if you're changing colors to be specific with the lobby, um, you will require a vote. So in general, it, it's what, how I started the conversation earlier, Dan, which is, you know, you're dealing with so many vendors, you're dealing with so many partners, um, it's important that you have them lined up. Uh, one of the ways that, that we, you know, especially with big projects, is we want to make sure that as a management company, we're aligning ourselves with individuals that are really dedicated to the field, that are improving our industry as a whole. So, for instance, you, what you do with your podcast and, and everything else that you do, it says a lot about your commitment to not only your business, but more importantly, to, to the industry as a whole and improving it. Uh, so we try to work with individuals as like that because it makes it much easier if you have a challenge. And you have someone that's out there and, and, and is committed to the industry, then they're going to do what's right for the community. Is it going to be cheaper? Most of the cases, probably not. But is the job going to get done? High probability that's going to, that, that it is. So, so it's important that as a board, you know, you have that responsibility, again, back to fiduciary, is if, where's, what's the balancing act, right? Of, uh, of, okay, am I going to go with the cheapest guy? Am I going to go with, with, with the most expensive? You have to find that right balance. And you have to work, you know, work with that with your management company. If you're self-managed, and these are decisions that you have to reach out to, to other uh, references and see what's going on so, so you understand. Because bringing it kind of back to the insurance, you know, dealing with an improper broker or, or dealing with, you know, not the right public adjuster or, or hiring a contractor that gives you an AOB, you could be finding yourself in a very difficult situation. And it's normally a, a pretty long process to resolve. Uh, imagine hiring the wrong person uh, to deal with that. So, yeah. uh, Dan, what I wanted to kind of throw back at you, because I know you went pretty in depth, but maybe for, for our board members that are newer board members and maybe haven't dealt with claims, maybe if you can give them kind of like a high level, especially now that we're walking into hurricane season, kind of give them a, a high level of, of, a, of a claims process and, and how you guide uh, your clients through that, through that, uh, through that, assert, through that process. Well, no, it's great, Rafael. And, and before I get that, I want to build off of, you know, what you just got to talking about, which is the typical construction process, to talk about the typical claims process. Um, and, and it's a, a great segue to it because you all just heard Rafael walk through a very complicated process to actually do construction. And one of the pitfalls that we see many associations fall into is that soon after the loss occurs, they immediately will engage a mitigation contractor to do mitigation and repairs. But the reality of it is that if you look in your insurance policy, it only obligates you to mitigate, stop the loss from getting worse. Then you have to stop, allow the insurance company to adjust the claim, pay you, get your recovery, your recovery being money, not rebuilding, totally different phase, recover the money you're entitled to, and then rebuild. Why? Because until you know how much you're going to recover and get paid, you have no idea how much you have to spend in order to rebuild. More importantly, though, soon after mitigating your loss, stopping it from getting worse, it's no longer an emergency. There is no, there is, there's not a situation where it is, in fact, an emergency. If your windows are boarded up because they broke from the hurricane or your elevator is shut down and in safety mode, again, it's no longer an emergency. I know I understand that there's certain obligations to getting, you know, your desire rather, to getting the elevator moving or the windows replaced or et cetera, whatever. The fact is, is though, you're not in an emergency situation. And before you go spend money that you don't have yet, 
you need to first determine how much money you have to spend. And the only way that protect your fiduciary responsibility obligation is to first adjust the claim. But if you don't know what you're legally entitled to recover pursuant to your contract or policy, and your broker's not there to adjust the claim, and your manager's not licensed to adjust claims, and your contractor is wants to rush ahead and start rebuilding and said, hey, don't worry about it. I'll just submit it to your insurance company. They'll simply reimburse me. But you don't even know what their full scope of their repairs are going to be. And if I'm obligated in a non-emergency situation to determine first what I can fix or do where I can do construction, I have to figure that out first, which may require permits, other licensed professionals like architects, engineers, to do simple drywall repairs in a common area hallway requires a permit in Miami-Dade, Broward, or Palm Beach. You must pull a permit. It's a fire-rated wall. So if you rush ahead and allow your contractor to go ahead and just start making repairs of the wall, I can tell you with firsthand knowledge, there's been stop work orders and unsafe structure notices slapped on buildings. Guess what? That stops closings in their in their in their footstep that Thanks, yep. will encourage people to bring lawsuits. All kinds of crazy things can happen as a result of that because you're not following the laws. You're not recovering the money you're entitled to first to then define the scope as to how you're going to spend it. You're spending money you don't even know where it's going to come from. So you get so, and then I've seen people special assess. Oh my God. Our deductible is $1.2 million to the hurricane. Let's go ahead and do a special assessment for $1.2 million. But you have no idea what you're claiming for or what you're ever going to recover. But you went ahead and made the special assessment. Many associations got sued after they recovered nothing and then found out that their damages were far less than the amount of their deductible. And then they had to give back that money. We saw that after Hurricane Irma. Avoid those situations. Understand the claims process. Let's talk about role players, right? So... In a insurance claim, you have many different role players. On the insurance company side, they have licensed independent adjusters that represent only their interest. Mm-hmm. Licensed independent adjusters. Licensed independent adjusters do not represent the interest of a policyholder. They only represent the interest of the insurance company. Those are the licensed professionals sent out by an insurance company to adjust your claim. Incidentally, they have no fiduciary obligations most often to your insurance company. They make no coverage determinations. They come out to the property, take pictures, write up fancy estimates, submit it to the insurance company to allow the insurance company to make the determination as to what they're going to pay. So some of us may know some independent justice because we've had many, many claims or we've been a board member or a manager for many, many years and think that you rely on the relationship to help influence the claim, or you can get it done because you've known this particular manager for a long, I mean, this particular adjuster for a long time. The fact is, is that they're not the decision makers. Again, this is all about decision makers and role players through this entire process. You also have your insurance agent and broker. They're kind of in the middle, right? They're in the gray area. They want to help you get insurance and they want to make sure that the product performs, but they're not licensed to actually adjust the claim. But remember at the same time, your commissions are coming directly most part from the insurance companies or you're writing a check back for that commission to them to pay them for selling you a product from the insurance company. But they need to, again, play both sides, right? They need to make sure that you're getting the product that you're entitled to, but they also wanna make sure that it's working for you, but they're not licensed to actually adjust the claim. So that's why they have those risk managers and claims professionals there to facilitate the process. But again, facilitating a process is not adjusting a claim. They're not getting onto the property, not writing up an estimate for your benefit. They're not adjusting the claim for your interest. So on the other side, you have public adjusters or lawyers, lawyers that can act as public adjusters or as legal counsel. But you don't want to jump to the legal counsel side because you want to adjust your claim first, right? You want to go through the process. Sometimes we see attorneys, unfortunately, promote this idea that hire them first. They'll go ahead and send out the notices. They'll go ahead and do these things. Believe me. If the reserves are not set in your claim by your insurance company and the independent adjuster has not reported back that information, the last thing you want to do is put your insurance company on its heels that you're all of a sudden already engaging in some type of litigation. In fact, what if you do ultimately go to litigation, it will be in your disinterest. It will be against your interest to have done that because anything they would have done from that point that that attorney gave notice of its representation of you 
will be deemed to be in response to this insinuation that there was going to be litigation and therefore protects everything the insurance company would do thereafter. So any delays they cause, any work product they produce, they will try to say that because you have brought in a lawyer early on, that they thought anticipate, reasonably anticipated litigation, and therefore everything they are doing on their side is protected. But you want to find out what they were doing to adjust your claim. Now you can't. So that's why I encourage people, don't run to your lawyer. Again, don't run to your contractor to adjust your claim. Run to a licensed professional that's going to adjust your claim, that's there to adjust the claim in, in, on your behalf, specifically on your behalf. Again, your insurance company will send out independent adjusters or company adjusters that represent their interest. And on your side, you have an opportunity to hire a licensed professional to represent your interest. And that's not your property manager. And that's not your contractor. Again, there's a huge campaign against the licensing practice of public insurance adjusting. And a lot of that is geared towards and focused on contractors that have convinced policyholders time and time again that they're going to take over that responsibility. So there's a huge amount of lawsuits filed by contractors where policyholders didn't even know they filed a lawsuit against their insurance company. And it came up in the actual renewal process going, oh, wow, you have a pending and open lawsuit or claim against another insurance company. It does not help facilitate that process. So be careful and look closely at that. And when you bring the contractor onto the site as part of the claims process, hire them to do one thing at a time. Hire them to mitigate your damages first. Check only that box. If you see tremendous amount of assignment of benefit language in there, have your legal counsel review it. I haven't seen a single community association attorney ever go, yeah, that's got my blessing. <laughs> okay. And I know Raphael is laughing over there because he knows that I'm, it's the, it is, it is almost always crossed out if the association board members and their manager ask the question of legal counsel. Because if you understand what it's like to assign all of your benefit and all of your rights over to another party whose only interest is in getting paid, then how do you control a contractor if you don't control the money? Yeah. As simple as that. You are assigning, you are removing your all of your obligations and putting them over to someone that is only interested in getting paid. So they're going to rush to get the job done. They're going to value engineer you to the job. It's not to say that they're all bad actors and there's not good contractors out there. But again, protect your fiduciary obligations as board members, as managers. Slow down. Take your time. Understand the process. This isn't a huge promotion to say, hey, hire public adjusters and hire lawyers to do all of this work. That's not what it's saying. But the fact is, is that whenever you're dealing with taxes or you're dealing with legal issues or you're dealing with management issues, you hire licensed professionals to deal with those things. In fact, when you're dealing with construction issues, you hire contractors. And when you're dealing with, let's say, other issues with, like regarding insurance, you might even hire an insurance consultant. But when it comes to insurance claims, for some reason, we just think, think that the insurance company will do the right thing. But time and time again, it's proven that it doesn't. And really, after you mitigate, your obligation is to exhibit your damages, display your damage to your insurance company for as long as they deem re reasonable. But you need to prove your damages. So how are you going to prove your damages? And hiring an engineer that doesn't specialize in insurance, that doesn't even see your policy? Go out and ask your broker if they have a copy of your policy immediately available at their fingertips. And what you'll find is most don't even have it. Oh, I'll go ahead and request it. Well, why don't you have it? You sold me the product. You mean me, you sold me a car you don't even have the keys to? Understand that a little bit, okay? And there's what's called the asking for the certified copy of the policy. That's the only copy of the policy that you can guarantee that is actually the policy for your community association. So if you're a board member, ask your manager, hey, do you have a copy of our certified copy of the insurance policy? Not just a copy of a policy, but the certified copy. And as a manager, ask your broker, hey, I need a certified copy of the policy. Put the request in writing. First one's always free. The second one, they may try to charge you for it, but you really shouldn't be asking for a second one because when you get the first one, make sure it gets scanned, uploaded, and shared with everyone. How do you know you got the certified copy? There'll literally be an affidavit on the cover sheet of the actual certified copy of the policy, swearing and attesting that that's the full and complete copy of the policy. That's, that's your guidebook to everything that you're obligated to do in the event that there is a loss. It also tells you most often what's not covered because it rarely tells you what's covered. It most often says, well, we're not going to pay for this. So if it doesn't specifically exclude it, then it's included. And that's a very confusing nuance. Again, 
why a licensed insurance professional like a public adjuster or a duly licensed attorney acting as a public adjuster can make sure you fully understand your obligations, your fiduciary obligations in dealing with a claim and making sure that you mitigate, stop, exhibit your damages, cooperate with your insurance company, recover the money you're entitled to, and then rebuild. Then you can go out to that bid process that Raphael talked about, collect all the professional information, get all that stuff, protect your fiduciary responsibilities, make sure that those three pillars are intact at the end of this process. Because many oftentimes people will hire unlicensed contractors or speed up the process or hire any, especially we're heading into storm season, right Raphael? Yep. Like you're just gonna hire anyone, right? Because you can't get to the contractor of choice, but take your time, stop, mitigate, okay? Mitigate, then stop. Recover the money out. The only way you can recover and make sure that you're getting everything you're entitled to is to properly adjust the claim. Slow down. Take your time through that process. That's really, really important. And, and I think it's something that a lot of people don't think that way, Raphael. And I, and I don't know about your experience, but that confusion over treating an insurance, rebuilding from an insurance, from an insurable loss is something other than just doing an, an improvements to the property or construction. Correct. Because if you have, especially particularly if you have multiple floors impacted, common yeah. areas, yeah. and now you're having to replace all the carpet on all the floors, that's an improvement. You, it's the same, falls under the same guidelines. A lot of bylaws require quorum votes. I mean, yeah. what has been your experience, Raphael, after major losses like that? How sure. did, how, what have you seen board members or, or property managers push for? So, you know, from, from our perspective, we, you know, residents, right? Let me start with residents because that's where we find the biggest challenge where residents, you know, you have a loss. So I'll give an example. We had a building that had a 22 unit uh, flood loss. Someone hung a dress on, on the sprinkler uh, pipe and on the sprinkler head and, and it popped. So 22 units were flooded that you can imagine the, the, the catastrophe that was and, and dealing and managing that situation. Um, but as you stated, Dan, the first thing, you know, you need to do is just mitigate. Okay, how are we going to stop this flood? How are we going to correct the, that flood, um, that pipe from not uh, causing any more issues? And then drying up whatever needs to be dried up. Uh, taking the next step is, is really the most challenging one um, because the residents, back to them, they want it done tomorrow. You know, it's like they have Swiss cheese uh, in their units, you know, holes all over the drywall. Uh, they have the baseboards removed. In some cases, certain pieces of drywall removed, maybe rugs or so forth. So they want the issue resolved fairly quickly. And the reality is, is, is kind of leaning on what you've uh, brought up, Dan, is it, it's not, it's, it is a two-step process. You know, in, in our case, we always strongly urge the association to get a public adjuster because as Dan mentioned multiple times, you know, the adjuster that works for the insurance company, their interest is to protect the insurance company. So there is a, a, you have to strike a balance, right? In this particular case, we knew 22 units, uh, the deductible for apparel loss is not much um, in essence. So uh, we knew that in this case, we needed to hire a public adjuster because we need to make sure that the, the association is brought whole. There's many things that are behind these walls that no one knows. In this particular example, fortunately enough, we hired a public adjuster. Uh, we didn't realize, no one would have realized uh, that the fire panel got completely soaked um, and that was that was realized later once there was an investigation done by the adjusters, uh, uh, um, engineers and so forth. So, you know, having the right professionals with you uh, does definitely help the process. It is a process and it can take time. And, and I and I say it here and you correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but I, I know that the process takes its time. But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility as a, as a board to make sure that you're bringing this building back to whole. Because what would have happened if the board would have said, you know what, just let the same restoration company put up the drywall, finish up the work and close everything up. A year down the line, we realized that that fire panel was damaged because of water damage. Well, guess what? If you didn't have any representation, you, you just signed a release that puts you in a position that you can't go back. So if you have the proper um, representation, the proper partnerships, then it makes it much easier for you to resolve um, these issues. It, it is a process. You know, part of being a board member is being a strong leader. And being a strong leader doesn't mean that you need to appease everyone. Um, but what we can do, or what if you have strong leadership from the board and management, what we can do is just communicate, let the residents understand why we're dealing with these challenges, how long these challenges are going to take, uh, that we need them to be a bit patient. And then we'll take the right steps um, because, again, if you don't take the right steps, you could find yourself 
in a much more expensive uh, situation uh, down the line. Uh, I wanted to take advantage since we're talking here about board members and so forth. There's a couple questions that I wanted to just address right now. Um, you, you know, there, there's uh, Thomas mentions here about about clubhouse repairs and and uh, and that the board's not acting on yeah. them. So ultimately, you know, as a resident, you have a responsibility to yourself uh, to, to make sure that your investment is protected. Every single year, you have the ability to vote out these uh, board members that are not doing what they should be doing on, on, on your best interest. So if you notice that a board is not taking the action that's necessary, you know, you have two ways that you can address it. You can address it via recall, very difficult process. It's possible. I've seen it very, I've only seen it once in my 15 years. Um, but you can also go through the election process and, and making sure that you're rallying up your troops in a positive way, I like to say, um, it, to, to really take the reign uh, of those, uh, take the position, I should say, of those board members, because ultimately, if they're not doing what they need to do, it's going to impact your investment and it's going to impact everyone within the community, especially an amenity like a clubhouse. And I, so, think, I think, Raphael, and I, I'm going to build on that, is the nature of those repairs. Um, you know, is it is it potentially an insurance claim too? Remember, you know, a lot of times it's a knee jerk reaction to not making the claim or, you know, because they don't, they think it's going to increase their rates or they're going to get dropped. Um, the fact of the matter is everyone that's tuned in here today has probably already seen a rate increase. And many of you may not have even had claims. Um, the fact is, is that during um, prior, about three years ago, we were seeing properties that were covering over $10 million on claims and seeing rate reductions. So when, when people talk to me a lot, they ask me questions, oh, should we plant the claim or not make the claim? And there's, yeah. you know, because we're gonna drop the rails, I always tell them, I said, look, this is market condition. It's not centrically focused on you. They may use it as an excuse to, to say drop you or, or claim that as the reason why they're raising your rates. But I can tell you, I can give you many examples where they didn't have claims, they still got rate increases, or they had major losses and they got a renewal at a lesser rate with that same insurance company. So look at the nature nature of that claim and, and make sure that your, or the nature of those repairs, look closely at those. And it's funny you mentioned, Raphael, like you've seen it one time. Um, we've just seen it in three, on three separate associations that we recently got hired where all three boards were recalled because of mishandling of a loss. Wow. Um, in two of the situations, they actually did not make a claim because they were advised by the broker, oh my God, your rates are gonna go up, we're pending a renewal. Ridiculous. And we actually pursued the claim in one particular situation. Um, we, we just, um, it, was, it was literally last week, um, about 40 some days after getting hired, after the recall occurred, um, got notice of over a half million dollar off from the insurance company to resolve it through the renewal, by the way. Uh, the renewal's not, not until the, uh, the, the uh, beginning of April. Um, and so it didn't even play a role in the renewal. And there was a half million dollars sitting on the table. But the prior board was recalled because of all of it. Guess what happened to the management company too? They got fired. Yeah. So just understand, people take this stuff serious. So think closely, ask the right questions, understand that you, by not taking action, it's just as bad as sitting back and doing nothing. But by making informed decisions and using what's called your your the business judgment rule, and it does apply here in Florida, um, and I'll give you another Florida statute, 617.0830, all right? It's a Florida statute that among non-for-profit corporations, should a board member act reasonably and make, make their decisions in good faith and in the best interest of the corporation, all right? So it's make sure that you are abiding by the business judgment rule in Florida when you're doing these things so you don't get recalled. And so someone doesn't hang you for the hang you on your fiduciary responsibilities and 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 you get nixed and then the whole thing, you know, all of a sudden you have exposure and your management companies, you know, everything that you've worked for in that whole process up that point is all, all goes away. So um, and remember, these are all your neighbors too. It's crazy right. the things I right. see going on. Um, you're all volunteers. I, I, I give it to you. Uh, you have a tough job to do, but do it right and ask the right questions. So. And, and so, Dan, could you give me kind of a, an idea of like, what's the main role of the public adjuster and, and how the public adjuster, I, I, I mean, I know how they assist management, but how it just assist management, the claim process, and also uh, the board of directors? Yeah. So under the floor steps of 626, a licensed public adjuster um, represents the interest of a policyholder in a first party or third party claim as a as a as a claim as a claimant on someone else's insurance 
um, as well as on the policyholder's own insurance for damages. And in exchange for a percentage of recovery, um, meaning a, a, let's say, I would say the typical for a community association range is like 10 to 20%, um, which is also regulated by the state of Florida. So in a state of emergency, like a major hurricane, you're going to be capped at 10%. Um, there's many, many rules and guidelines to it. And we're very highly regulated as public adjusters. So um, if you are hiring one, do your research, uh, understand that process. Um, we're there to assist in identify, identifying issues of coverage and uh, uh, exhibiting your damages, proving your damages, um, meeting with the insurance company, negotiating with them on your behalf. Um, but you as a board member uh, or board members and managers um, as fiduciaries, which we are not as public adjusters, are ultimately make the decision as to what willingness to accept a settlement or a payment, um, as well as to drop a claim or not bring a claim. So, um, but we're there as your licensed advisor to ensure that you are adhering to the guidelines set forth in the contract, as well as the Florida law, like submitting a sworn yes. statement proof of loss um, and uh, making sure that you're obtaining proper estimates and information um, related to your, your claims um, or where there may be necessary to re retention of an expert to help specifically for um, identifying an issue of coverage or causation, you know, again, specific issues. Um, it's, it's, it's a very complex process. We meet with the insurance company directly. We talk to the decision makers at the insurance company. Uh, we make sure that you're protecting your rights and responsibilities and adhering to them. So in the event that it does not go right and the insurance company does not pay or pay 100% or delays it, um, that and you do seek the advantage of court, that you've, you've actually protected your interests and you can prove that your insurance company has failed you um, in actually paying you. But there's also alternative means of disputes um, a lot of people don't even know those are available to us. So we're there to educate you about the process from start to finish. Again, it's complicated. It's nuanced. It's something you need to make sure that someone has a lot of experience in. Again, our team has licensed contractors and engineers, attorneys. Like we have, we have, we have access to all these professionals, whether they are licensed. I mean, I mean I'm sorry, whether they are fully salaried employees or contractors that we contract the work out to, to help us in doing those things. We don't and get involved in the construction process because again, it's not part of the recovery process to the extent that we are steering you to, towards someone to rebuild. We're most interested in making sure that your mitigation efforts are compliant with your policy and that what they're doing, you're gonna get a recovery for. And if you're not, we want to make sure that you're aware that some sort of scope of whatever the mitigation contract is doing is not. We wanna make sure that you, you're aware of those issues up front. No surprises on the back end. Now, that's not to mean that the insurance company won't surprise you with some issues of coverage and things down the, down the road, but we want to make sure that we avoid as many of those as we possibly can. So, Correct, correct. And, and, and I have found that over the years that the experience of dealing with a proper public adjuster, especially a professional one, um, it, it, it's, 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 it's an ease normally for, for the manager. Again, the challenge always comes with, with regards to dealing with the residents and the speed that they want things done. Yeah. Um, but the recovery percentages, the difference in percentages from what you would have gotten from the adjuster um, compared to the the eyes of the public adjuster, it, it, it's night and day. Um, and again, a lot of certain board members or associations believe, you know, it's it's to create excess funds. But the reality, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to bring the association whole um, and, and make sure that that the damages that were uh, that were had are, are properly um, corrected. Yeah. Um, uh, so with regards to, I want to touch up, I know we're wrapping up here, but I definitely want to get, um, uh, kind of get into a one little topic, at least on the hurricanes, um, on the hurricane side, um, then, um, what does your firm do in order to, to assist managers? Do you have like forms that we're able to execute beforehand, um, to kind of have you already lined up? If you can kind of give, a, give our board members and managers that are here on the webinar today, uh, a quick response on that. As fiduciaries, you want to make sure that you're prepared, right, and for anything. And part of that is your hurricane preparedness. And we do. On our website, we have what's called a preferred client services uh, program. Um, once enrolled, it's a one-year commitment. Um, we're there to help you in, in all of your planning. Um, I know um, Infinity and, and does a great job of putting together these manuals and making sure that you have proper documentation. Um, we want to basically do the fire drill, right? We want to act as if it's here now and today. Um, it's, it's great talking about doing things to avoid or protect you against damage. Uh, we want to assume that you're going to have damage. And then what is it, 
what is it? What do you do next? What is your next steps? And we'll walk, walk you through that entire process. How do you give proper notice? When to give notice? The difference between prompt notice to your insurance company versus immediate notice. A lot of people run to call their broker. Oh, I got to get first in line. There's no first in line when it comes to reporting the claims. Um, you want to make sure that you give prompt notice on immediate notice. Um, prompt notice is very different than immediate. Unless you know what's going on, we'll walk you through it. We'll make sure that we're documenting things, taking pictures of stuff before, during, and after any major uh, event occurs. But again, this is about fiduciaries, right? Pr protecting that fiduciary obligation and responsibilities as board members, as property managers, making sure you're doing things to put the association, uh, make sure that you're willfully not just saying, oh, I'm just, you know, don't have time for that, or um, being ignorant about it, that it's, it's not going to happen to us. We have brand new windows and roofs and look at our property. Believe me, some of the most catastrophic damage I've ever seen has occurred on buildings that were, are newly built yeah. um, or newly renovated. Um, the reality of it is, is that there may be certain deficiencies that may be exposed by these storms or whatever else that are unforeseen. That doesn't mean the claim isn't recoverable. In fact, most policies say if it's unforeseen or unknown of, it is recoverable. So um, again, make sure that you're, you're, you're putting yourself in the best position, but that doesn't only just go for me as a vendor. Uh, or Global Pro, but also other contractors like mitigation companies and um, and roofers. There, we all have these programs that are, especially particularly in the tropics, um, to help you and assist you plan for that what if, uh, that major what if, and want to make sure that you're getting front of line service, making sure that you're a priority, and it's important that you get your name on that list um, so that we can do that because everyone's resources are tapped. And anyone that tells you anything different is totally lying to you. Um, yeah. and, and we're all scrambling around to make sure that we're taking care of everyone else. Um, making sure that you're, you're, the, the people that you're aligning yourself with are not over committing themselves in the event that there is a what if too is really, really important. Um, so start asking questions, go through an interview process because while, it's, while it may not be this storm season, which by the way, has been moved up. Um, they moved the dates May 15 um, and, and going on in the future, maybe 2022 or, and beyond. Um, but practicing as many times, just remember when you're an adolescent and you were in uh, elementary school, how many times you did a fire drill or a hurricane drill, yeah. um, you need to be doing that for your community association. It applies just the same. Um, where are the shutters? Where are the flood panels? Where are we going to get sandbags from? Um, what are we going to do with our marinas and dock areas? Um, landscaper, their trimming practices. Do they even know how to trim a tree so it doesn't fall down and collapse on our property? Uh, making sure that they have a licensed arborist on staff that actually is familiar with the types of trees you have. That's really important too. Um, a lot of landscapers are kind of like a one-stop shop, but they have no actual experience in dealing with banyan trees and they're really great with palms. Uh, yeah. So just understand what if your landscaping is not covered? What are you going to have to deal with it? And where are you going to haul that debris and who are you going to call it? You know, how are you going to get hold of your unit owners? Uh, where's that list of people? How did you share your insurance policies? There's so many different things that I know Affinity does a great job of putting in a great position, but there's a lot of insurance requirements to making a claim and through that process. And when you have limited resources on that day one after a loss, believe me, scrambling around to try to get your policy from your broker or to try to figure out what you're covered for or what not you're covered for, it's not going to work. Cell reception sucks. Your emails aren't coming in. You can't get people on the phone because guess where all your brokers and professionals live? in the same area yep. and many of them will evacuate and i think that's a lesson learned after hurricane irma so many of them went other places and were like trying to do it remotely because they made their staff stay um, <laughs> so let's know who you're dealing with uh, i think it's really important and, and check out the preferred client services program online uh it's pretty easy get globalpro.com you see all of our contact information there um like us follow us on facebook uh we do a lot of broadcasts a lot of information there downloadable in a resource section um, we're constantly putting things out we're constantly partnering with with management firms like affinity uh we've done a number of these with Raphael. i i i think what they're doing is is fantastic the frequent uh tips on linkedin and if you're not on linkedin link up with both of us um i know Raphael's doing a lot of that pushing out a lot of that content um again this stuff isn't sexy and it's not fun and you know maybe <laughs> much attention as you might have want to see, but, um, you know, make sure that you, uh, you, you adhere to that. Um, and we do have a question here about the public adjusting laws as far as cap to 10% and the, yeah, I was going to ask you that. Um, it check, check out, uh, check it out online, um, under, under the floor session 626. Um, there are certain guidelines depending on the type of uh, property or the type of policy. 
um, you know, as it applies to community associations or homeowners. Um, and remember, you're written on a commercial policy form. So um, it's important that um, you understand the difference between a commercial policy form for community association. Um, there's a lot of language in there about business income that are, totally doesn't apply. Um, but particularly regarding the fees, um, I range between 10 or 20% because we're not just talking about hurricane claims here. Um, we're talking about really any claims. And that's a typical range that we're seeing right now in the market um, for associations. Uh, but there's plenty of, there was a study done by the state of Florida, as, as Rafael mentioned, and I know we're wrapping up here quick. Um, OPAGA, which is a government, governing body, was lobbied by citizens to do an investigation into the impact of public adjusting. And policyholders who hired a public adjuster at the onset of a loss, fiduciaries, um, recovered more than 500 to 700% more than they did it on their own. Value Penguin last year put out a report that over 68% of policyholders were complaining about unfair settlements and insurance claims. So there's not a trend towards taking care of the policyholders. That's all I can say. And certainly enough evidence to show U.S. fiduciaries, if you do hire a licensed professional to represent you, most often will recover more than if you do it on your own. And it's not about just getting as much as you can, as Rafa and Abos mentioned. It's about getting what you're entitled to. And so often that first offer of what comes to the insurance company is not that, um, unfortunately. And I like to say that it is, but it's, it's quite frankly not. Um, and for a lot of different reasons, a lot of times it's just the reporting by board members or property managers as to what their damages are. They missed so many things, as Raphael mentioned, how they didn't know about the, the fire panel and the issues that were that they should have looked for. So again, that's what we're licensed to do. That's what we're experts in. So consider those resources. Excellent. Well, Dan, um, I want to wrap up here and I wanted to thank uh, you and your team. You guys are amazing in the work that you do, the marketing efforts that you guys do as well. Um, it's been a pleasure being sitting alongside here with you. Uh, for those of you that want to reach us, you saw our contact information here. Um, uh, also, feel free to visit our YouTube page uh, at Affinity. We'll be posting this on YouTube and also we'll repost it on LinkedIn for those of you that are following us. As Dan mentioned, if you're not following us, make sure to follow Global Pro. Make sure to follow Affinity. And uh, we'll do our best to con continue to educate um, our board members and managers and continue to push our industry forward. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And I think Dan here also does an amazing job with his podcast. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, make sure you check it out uh, every Thursday at 11. I'm not sure when the next one is it next week already, Dan? Uh, there's this, this uh, at 11 o'clock on Thursday, uh, we will okay. uh, we will have another broadcast. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here today. I don't know if you want to say any closing statements, Dan, or I think you're good. No. I mean, I'm good. I'm good, guys. Just remember, you know, uh, you know, role players is important, understanding them. Um, look particularly at them. I know we talked a lot about insurance claims, a lot about public adjusting, things like that. Um, I think it was just a different angle, um, new information. You have a lot of questions there. Um, I know uh, Fendi will reach out to those that are submitted questions and make sure, um, and, and as well as Global Pro to make sure you get answers to those questions uh, to the best of our abilities. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, let us know if there's anything we can do. Thank you, uh, Fendi, Raphael, and your whole team. Uh, it's been a pleasure doing this with you. And we look forward to uh, engaging with all of you in the future. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.